let me enter into this conversation by giving a historical context. In the month of May 1963, the leaders of the then independent African countries assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And many speeches were delivered and the thrust of all the speeches was that African countries having regained their independence, their primary focus and objective was to ensure that they exercise their regained mandate for the benefit of the people to ensure uh, that the people were liberated from ignorance, disease, and poverty. On the 24th day of May, perhaps the most powerful speech ever made by an African leader was delivered by Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah. And he reminded the leaders who were present on that day about a number of things. One, he told them that not to delude themselves, that by regaining their independence, the erstwhile colonizer would recoil and remain inactive. That in fact, the erstwhile colonial master was going to be more pernicious, but in a very subtle way. Kwame Nkrumah was right. He reminded his audience that going forward, it was necessary and indeed urgent that Africans should begin to think as one whole because if they remained in disunity, they would remain weak and vulnerable and therefore susceptible to manipulation. Kwame Nkrumah was right. He reminded his audience that because many of, if not all, of the African countries were artificial, they were created in Berlin, and the boundaries were artificial, but he urged his audience that they should respect the inviolability of the boundaries because if they tried to redraw the boundaries, conflict would never end. And that was reinforced in 1964 in Cairo on the doctrine of inviolability of inherited boundaries. I remind us of this particular incident 58 years ago because in 2013, the African Union came with Agenda 2063. And if you look at the text of Agenda 2063, and the speeches that were given around it, it was the rehash of what Kwame spoke about and the other leaders spoke about. And it's not lost on me last year that one of the themes of African Union was the silencing of the guns by the year 2020. I'm not a Jewish prophet, but the guns will not be silent next year. <coughs> in fact, there are more guns that are emerging in Africa which means that peace is still very elusive. And then we have been given the history. The founding fathers of the African countries took the view that because we are states made out of many nations, there was wisdom in having a style of politics that was different so that in the early days of many African countries, many leaders held the view. Whether they were mistaken or not is another debate for another day. But they held the view that one of the things that they had to do was to have single party states. So that if you went to Zaire then or Congo before it became Zaire or Zambia or Malawi or Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania, Everybody believed that in order to hold the many nationalities together, you needed a single party under whose aegis 
organization of state affairs would be undertaken. Mistakes were made. And then the conceptual West convinced us that our salvation could only come from something they call democracy. And I'm using the word very deliberately, something they call democracy, which they defined. And they defined it in English, if you are colonized by the English. And they defined it in French, if you are colonized by the French. And they defined it in Portuguese, if you are colonized by the Portuguese. And they defined it in Spanish, if you are colonized by the Spaniard. We never defined it in Kinyarwanda, no. It was never defined in Igbo or Yoruba. And we were told after the collapse of the Soviet Union that democracy was equals to, one, multi-party politics, two, periodic elections, three, limitation of terms of the presidency. That is how the conceptual West defined it for us. And we who have had the advantage, if it is an advantage at all, of being educated in the West, there is a sense in which our thought processes are also confined by those definitions. However much we want to free ourselves, we find our default mode being how we were trained. So when we define democracy, we are also caught up in this box. Sometimes we tell ourselves to think outside of the box, but the true north of our thought processes still remains the box. We never think without the box. <laughs> so when we talk about peace in Africa and we talk about adversarial politics, we are not talking about anything that is African. The political party is not African. It is something that we inherited. You know, in the United Kingdom, they talk about the loyal opposition, loyal to the monarchy. Because there is a process. Permit me to say at this stage that Africa deals with uh, diversity much better than Europe. Much better. If you look at your typical European nation, the Dutch is the Dutch, largely. The Swedes are the Swedes, largely. The Norwegians are the Norwegians, largely. The Finns are the Finns, largely. And where they have many ethnicities, they don't do very well. Ask the Spaniards if you doubt me. <laughs> where they had many nations in Yugoslavia, ask them. They created many nations to create pure ethnicities. But African nations have succeeded thus far in working with diversity in very unique circumstances where the conceptual West, despite their protestation to the contrary, are always interfering in our affairs in a very subtle manner. When we are holding election, they will deny it. But there is a way in which they are always moving in a subterranean fashion. Because the, the, the thesis still is that you divide them in order to rule them. That is the thesis. We don't say it as loudly as we should because we want to be politically correct and I refuse to be correct. And this is exactly what Kwame Nkrumah warned us about. And the political party therefore lends itself to that manipulation. We will be persuaded because it is us who have gone to school who form political parties will be persuaded to form outfits. And in many African countries, these outfits are formed on the basis of ethnic affiliation. Your typical African political party is simply an assembly of ethnicities. And in many African nations, you will discover that what we call elections is simply an ethnic census to determine which ethnic group is larger than the other. It is, Kwame, it is Julius Nyerere of Tanzania who said it. He said that the tragedy of Africa is not what the song is not the song that is being sung, but who the singer is. And what he meant was very clear: that you may have an agenda that is good for your nation, but if you do not come from a particular ethnic group, those who will follow you will not be from your ethnic group. You may sing the best song 
But when you look back, you'll discover that it's only people from your ethnic group who are following you. And when you have such a situation, the design is inherently conflictual. And that is why, therefore, when you look at Africa today, you discover that after every election cycle in many African countries, there is conflict. Because you go into the election or the political parties go into an electoral process on the basis that we must win. And if we don't win, the elections have been rigged. In other words, we place so much premium on the presidency. And you'll see in many African countries, entry into government is like winning a lottery. It is winning a lottery because it gives you access to resources. And therefore, people say, people claim the president. If you are in a country, you say, and one of your own, one of your own means a son. They are normally sons. One of your own sons has won the presidency. The tribe celebrates from the herdsman the herdsman to the professor, from the fisherman to the intellectual, because we have now won the presidency. We have won the lottery. We will have ministers. We'll have all these, and everybody else feels excluded, and that generates conflict. And we have seen it, whether if we don't see it in Gabon, we see it in Guinea-Bissau. If we don't see it in Guinea-Bissau, we see it in Kenya. If we don't see it in Kenya, we see it in South Sudan. So that in South Sudan, if one were to ask them, what is the problem? The contest is of an ethnic kind. They are contesting because one of our own must occupy the state house. And that is why, therefore, you see, under the guise of democracy in a number of African countries, we create offices which are sinecures. You will have a president, you'll have a deputy president, you'll have a second deputy president, you'll have a prime minister, first prime minister, first sec prime, all those useless offices which make no sense because you have to appoint people into those offices and give them a motorcade so that when they go to their villages, they look important. And the people own them as ours. People want to be included. In such a scenario, my verdict is number one. Africa's long-term salvation demands that we avoid adversarial politics. Africa's salvation demands that we define for ourselves what democracy means. And you said it very correctly, Professor, and the good uh, friend from the United Kingdom, very correctly, what people want is to participate. What people want is to have a government that is accountable. Many people in many African countries simply want food on the table. Many people in many African countries simply want to have access to health care. Many people simply want good education. Young men and women in Africa simply want opportunities for innovation and invention. And they want a government that creates an, an environment where that can be achieved. And therefore, in my view, I think the time has come that Africa must define herself. One of the problems that we have in Africa is that we do not define ourselves. And permit me to annoy you. In many African nations today, after every election, whether we like it or not, we have observers. And when the elections are being held, observers may come from Nigeria, from Kenya, from Uganda, but people are waiting. What did the European Union say? You know, this belief by us that the Europeans have a divine duty to tell us what to do and we have a divine duty to accept to do what they say is one of the problems that we have. And until the day that we liberate ourselves to decolonize our minds, in a manner of speaking, we are going to embrace the kind of politics that will only perpetuate conflict. Right now, as I move towards my conclusion, I simply want you to look at the map of Africa. And look at the map of Africa against the declaration that the guns must be silenced by 2020. And simply tell me, is there peace and calm in Niger? Is there peace and calm in Burkina Faso? Do you have peace and calm in Mali? Is it peaceful in Mauritania? Is it peaceful in Benin? Is it peaceful in Gabon? Is it peaceful 
in, 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 uh, in Cameroon? Is it peaceful in South Sudan? Is it peaceful in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Is it peaceful in Somalia? It, you look at the map of Africa and you look at that and you are being told through declarations that we are going to silence the guns in 2020. It's as if you are being told to go to Kigali but, and, and meanwhile you have engaged a gear taking you to the Democratic Republic of Congo's border and you are on jet-like speed. This, this, this is why I think that it is incumbent upon us to remember one thing that peace is not merely the absence of war. It is much deeper than that. That de development is not building of skyscrapers in African cities, no. And that therefore, if we want to sustain peace and development, what we must look at are the human indices. I think the Bhutanese have got it right. They what they call the gross national happiness index. These things that you, Europe tells us many useful things, but they are certainly useless things that they tell us. One of them is the thing called per capita income, that they take all the wealth, half of which is owned by two people, and then they divide it and say, the per capita income is $800. <laughs> and meanwhile, all other people are suffering. <laughs> I'm submitting to us that time has come that we must define what development is. I want to go to a typical Rwandese village and beyond peace, beyond the absence of war, I want to see peace at the dinner table. I want to see peace at the hospital and the dispensary. And I'm suggesting to us that politics defines all these. And one of the things that we must do, and Professor, I can't agree with you more, is that there is no one size fits all. There is no one size fits all. What works for Rwanda is not necessarily what works for Uganda. In 1984, the Ethiopians came up with a constitution which I think is the only one in the world that allowed, that defines itself on the basis of ethnic identity and even allows the ethnicities to secede under certain conditions. Whether it has worked or not, I think the jury is still out. But they recognize the fact that ethnicities are real. And if we continue to delude ourselves in Africa that ethnicities are unreal, we are cheating ourselves. Even the United States of America nowadays, when you hear them talking about the vote, they, they talk about the Hispanic vote. They talk about the black vote. They talk about the Caucasian vote. They are beginning to recognize that those blocks are critical. How then do you use them in a manner that is positive? Because look at the Democratic Republic of Congo with over 233 ethnicities. Look at Nigeria with over 200 languages. Look at Kenya with over 56. Look at Tanzania with 136 plus. These are the realities in the African nation. And I am convinced that going forward, number one, we need to have peace. But we will not have peace by declaring that peace will come and reign. We must do things that move us in the direction of attaining peace. And until we introduce what I've called elsewhere hygiene in our politics, we are moving nowhere. And part of the introduction of hygiene is to recognize the environment and the context in which we operate. One of the, move, the areas in which we must move is to recognize that going forward, we are different nations in single states trying to create mega nations. And unless we have inclusivity so that people belong, feel they belong. And I want to give this example. In, in Kenya, it happens, and I believe in other countries. When an individual is elected as a member of parliament, in many African countries, they have things they call homecoming parties. These homecoming parties is an attempt to demonstrate to the village by the newly elected member of parliament or newly appointed minister that we went to hunt. We have come back with a prize. That prize is membership in parliament or a ministerial post. Let us eat and celebrate. 
so that when you want to punish that individual, you are not punishing the holder of the office, but you are punishing the whole village. People own these positions. And I'm suggesting to us that politics must be of such a nature that allows ethnicities and groups to negotiate. I do not as yet have an answer which I think I can pin on the ground, but I have the following things. That it cannot be uniform that it must be specific to the circumstances of each country, that it is us who must define it, and that we must have a vocabulary for it, and that we must warn ourselves that the erstwhile colonial master is alive and well, subterranean and pernicious to the core. Don't delude yourselves. And remember that sometimes the disunity of Africa is big business. And if we forget that, we will once again be manipulated. Lastly, I saw the African National Congress winning an election in South Africa last week. Not that it's a bad thing, but somebody sent me a clip that was very telling. It was a clip where all the celebrants were Chinese, and they were celebrating, hail African National Congress Chinese in in Johannesburg. <laughs> that laughter suggests to me that you have understood my message. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs>